Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight, whether you're with us here in the room or for those who are joining online. Um, we're so glad you could be with us. My name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation drawn together, Ruth Asawa's Art and Life. So this program is part of a series of public programs in conjunction with the exhibition Ruth Asawa Through Line, which is currently on view here at the Whitney. Um, and it's the first exhibition devoted to Asawa's drawings, which as you will hear tonight and have hopefully seen in the show, was an expansive and generative practice for the artist. The incredible range of the exhibition, including many works that are being exhibited for the first time, reflects the deep research and care of the curatorial team. Co-organizers Kim Conaty, Stephen and Anne Ames, curator of drawings and prints here at the Whitney, and Edward Kopp, John R. Eckel, Jr., foundation chief curator of the Menil Drawing Institute, along with Scout Hutchinson, curatorial fellow at the Whitney Museum, and Kristen Marples, curatorial associate at the Menil Drawing Institute. Thank you to Kim and Scout for your wonderful, your wonderful partnership on tonight's event and all of the education programming for the show. As tonight's program considers an artist who thought deeply about place and the natural world, I want to acknowledge that the Whitney is located in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the the Lenape people. As a result of centuries of colonialism, today the, Len the Lenape live in a diaspora throughout the US and Canada. Alongside the Lenape, many other indigenous nations have ancestral ties to this place now known as New York, including the six Haudenosaunee nations, Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Mohawk, Oneida, and Onondaga, and the Shinnecock and Puspatuck. If you're joining us online, please take a moment to identify and recognize the indigenous people who have always and continue to steward the land from where you're joining us. It's truly exciting to bring together our three extraordinary speakers to consider how Asawa's approach to drawing as an active mode of seeing, recording, understanding, and participating in the world around her is deeply intertwined with her unique engagement with the seemingly ordinary elements of everyday life. I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers and then turn things over to Kim, who will serve as the moderator tonight. And I'm gonna read their, bio, their bios in order of where, how they're gonna speak and how they're sitting. So Kate Zambrino is a writer based in New York. She is the acclaimed author of 10 books that cross genres and I would say expand them. Her most recent book is The Light Room, um, a meditation on art and care. Elisa Pitcherman, am I getting that right? I meant to check. Elisa Pitcherman Alexander is the Robert M. and Ruth L. Halprin Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art and co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative at the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford University. She organized the ongoing installation, The Faces of Ruth Asawa at the Cantor and her essay for the exhibition catalog, um, the catalog for Ruth Asawa through line, entitled Drawn Together, Ruth Asawa and Community, gave tonight's conversation its name. And finally, Tony Lewis is an artist based in Chicago. His practice is dedicated to various forms of drawing. His work is the subject of a solo exhibition, a current solo exhibition at the Orange County Museum. Um, and Lewis I can't help but mention that Lewis was also participated in the 2014 Whitney Biennial. Um, so following the conversation, we have both the exhibition catalog and the light room available for purchase right outside of the theater and authors who will sign them. So think of all the people who would love to receive these gorgeous books for the holidays. Tonight's conversation <laughs> will be about generosity. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I assume you've all read them and have them anyway, but you can b just buy more. Um, once you purchase a book or two, um, you are also invited to view Ruth Asawa through line on the eighth floor until 9 p.m. So we hope that you'll take that opportunity to um, see or re-see the show. Um, thank you all again for being here with us tonight and um, I'll turn things over to Kim. Um, thanks so much, Megan, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm really excited um, and have been looking forward to this conversation 
tonight, and I'm thrilled to have Elisa, Kate, and Tony, our three brilliant minds and makers here with us. Um, as Megan mentioned, this program was inspired by the exhibition Rupasawa Through Line, which, um, if you have not already seen it, is on view at the Whitney, if you don't have a chance to see it later tonight, through January 15th. And after the Whitney, it will travel to the Manil Collection, specifically the Manil Drawing Institute, where it'll open on March 22nd. Um, for tonight, we wanted to create a program that would really celebrate the insights that can be gained, as well as the new questions posed by this um, first ever survey of Asawa's drawing practice. And you know, through the process of working on this project, which my co-curator Edward Kopp and I still refer to as the dream, um, we came to discover um, in researching so really sheet after sheet, sketchbook after sketchbook, how profoundly Asawa's drawings reveal her most intimate and expansive ruminations on the world around her, and how they so often grow out of her belief that, as she once said, everything is connected. Um, I want to open with this work somewhat symbolically. Um, this is a punch tin drawing from the late 1960s made for a window, specifically her window, uh, Asawa's window for her home. Um, and we have it here positioned in our galleries as really the kind of the closing or perhaps the opening of the exhibition. Um, what I love in thinking about this work and really thinking about some of the ideas we'll talk about tonight is that this, is, this was a drawing made um, not on a support but through it. Um, it's really, it's a rupture or maybe a literal expression <coughs> of how one might see the world through drawing and see drawing as part of the world or as part of life. So tonight's conversation will take up the idea of Asawa's art and life and how in the artist's work, these were tr uh, quite literally drawn together. And thanks again, <laughs> Elisa, for your great essay title. Um, so tonight we'll discuss some of the core ideas that underpin Asawa's lifelong drawing practice and that ultimately cross over several sections of the exhibition, including her commitment to teaching and learning as a kind of continual generative practice. Um, this is something that we point to at the very start of the exhibition through this group of works you see on the slide, uh, work she made as a student at Black Mountain College and really returned to so many of these ideas throughout her life. We'll also discuss ideas of reciprocity, um, of gift giving and receiving, and really of art making as part of an exchange between individuals. We'll also talk about questions around repetition in process as part of making, um, a more perhaps interior mode of making, a more internal way of making a, about absorption study of lines and their movements and also their consequences. And we'll talk about dailiness and care, um, how the day-to-day -day of, um, of one's life could be part of, could be, that the art making could be part of this, that it could be of this, that it could be from life. But first we'll start with reflections from our speakers each of whom has chosen a work or two of Asawa's as a point of departure that touches on their own responses to the work. So I'm excited to turn it over to them now and to begin our conversation about this extraordinary artist who drew as a way of seeing and who saw the world through drawing. So I'll turn this to Kate first. Okay, thanks Kim. Um, hi, it's so nice to see all of you and thanks everyone at home for logging on. Um, should I wait for this one? Um, this, this piece is, when I saw this piece in the show, this diptych, really a diptych across um, this, the, the date 1960 sketchbook of, of baby Addie sleeping, I was incredibly moved, moved by it. Um, the intention and care to draw a napping child. Um, and there's something so also very charming to think of, you know, to draw a napping child. The child is finally still um, only, you know, she had, Rufusawa had six young children at home in the 1950s. And so you think, you don't know, but you think about the chaos of that household and how full time must have been. And so the nap is finally a time where the 
child can become a subject, right, for her art, can be can be drawn. Um, and I'm really just so, the one on the left, the, the tendrils, the care of drawing, the hair, the little, the little puckered sleeve, that puff sleeve and the puckered lips and the lashes, there's such tenderness and delicacy to it. And, and also such beauty, um, you know, a napping child, um, is, there's often such abandonment to it. A child is finally sleeping. Um, and I was thinking of this diptych, you know, we don't know how much time has elapsed across these two drawings, but it does operate a bit like a calendar when I look at it. It could be days have passed since there was a drawing. Um, these are two separate scenes of, of, of baby Addie. We don't know the ellipses or how time has elapsed. Um, perhaps there hasn't been time for other sketches between these two. Maybe their studies over a week. Um, my book, The Lightroom, begins when I have my youngest as a newborn at home, only weeks in when I have to go back to teaching over Zoom because of the pandemic. I have a three-year-old at home full time. It's not the full house that Ruth Asawa had. But, and I'm still writing in my notebook um, this daily practice. I'm doing it only while breastfeeding, crouching over my napping child. And in the book I call the period of sickness or intense care of time passing without documentation, the vortex. So when I think of <coughs> these two drawings, I think of these acts of devotion, these gestures, these moments that are most likely from within a vortex of caretaking. In the present day now, my children have been alternating with high fevers, if anyone takes care of children or has children. It is the sickness season. Um, our now seven-year-old, who was three in the book, has been coming to our bed. We've been doing fever care in the middle of the night, which is you know, quite arduous. The, the cold compresses, the bath, the monitoring. But this morning, it was like five in the morning, and I was thinking of Ruth Asawa, and I was thinking of this diptych. I just watched my child sleep, and even at seven, my child still looked like a baby, right? There was still that beauty and that abandonment, and maybe, maybe that's only the beauty and abandonment a maternal gaze can give us. Um, there's a relief to a sleeping child. They are finally at rest. You know, and when I look at this, we don't know all the activity that has gone on. Addie seems quite peaceful, but maybe she refused to nap. Maybe she had been fighting with her siblings. Um, there's, she was demanding for snacks, for attention, while Ruth, her mother, is trying to do a million things at once, trying to make art at home while running a household. It's so ephemeral, this state, like so much of what Ruth Asawa drew of the domestic space. They won't be at sleep forever. They won't be children or babies forever. And what other time would they allow for their beauty to be documented? I was also thinking of dailiness, and I know we'll get back to it, but there's such an insomniac energy to Ruth Asawa's drawings. Um, not only the drawings of the babies and the children, but the, with anything. You know, she's drawing while children are napping, Sometimes she's drawing children napping. She also drew in the middle of the night, which remind me of Louise Bourgeois's insomnia drawings. Although Louise Bourgeois's insomnia drawings are usually abstractions, and for Ruth Asawa, there would be these abstractions. Um, I think you have um, the one of Paul in the quilt, um, but emits, this just kills me, emits her abstractions, this, you know, like very ornate, um, pattern, this quilt, there is this tender, humorous baby being caught, being caught within the pattern. Um, how the home has to hold a sleeping child like the quilt. Um, yeah. The gaze of this watcher, so attentive and so exhausted, 
And I was thinking of the napping children, like, and then the pictures we've seen of Ruth Osala drawing, and I think she's older at this point, she has like her hand like on her thing, and she's drawing, and there's such an exhausted energy to it, and it reminds me of the angel and Durr's melancholia, right? Like this watching, this, this watching over everything, and all of the Pudos, and I, I was also thinking of, you know, all of the babies in, all the sleeping babies in, in Renaissance, in Renaissance art. Um, I can also talk about this photograph later, the image in coming here. So I think I've, I've gone on for a while. Um, thanks so much, Kate, and thank you so much, Kim and Megan, for this invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, and it's such a contribution of the show to those of us who think that we knew Ruth Asawa. Um, it turns out, you know, there's so much more to discover, and so there's so many um, revelations upstairs uh, that are very meaningful and that I'll continue to think about for a long time. Um, but I'll open uh, simply with saying that I love talking about Ruth Asawa. For those of us who live in the Bay Area and work in the arts, Asawa is both a historical figure and a kind of spiritual creative matriarch, though I don't really know how much she would like being called that. Uh, but the impact of her life and work are ever present, even though it's been a decade since she's passed. I never had the pleasure of meeting Asawa while she was alive. But in the Bay, it seems like everyone is less than six degrees of connection from her. Since I opened our permanent installation at the Cantor called The Faces of Ruth Asawa in July 2022, I frequently get emails from visitors sharing with me their experiences with her. Uh, whether they were the subject or of a life mask or recall Asawa leading a workshop at their elementary school, I'm really moved by their impulse to share these stories with me and to tell me on the record just how important she was um, and what a special person she was uh, in the Bay. Just the other day, I had a board member who, in advance of uh, t this evening, she emailed me some pictures of the many botanical drawings she received from Asawa as thank you notes over the years, and thank God she saved them, right? Uh, so this brings me to this particular botanical drawing. Asawa's botanicals are some of my favorite of her drawn bodies of work because they're not only connected to her origins of growing up on a farm in Norwalk, California, but they also serve as records of relational encounters between the artists and those close to her. Unlike artists who choose to obscure their biographies in their work, Asawa's life really grounds her practice, especially her drawings. And I think there's something tremendously radical about that orientation, especially for an Asian American woman living through the 20th century, whose life was very directly impacted by racist legislation and prejudice. In this drawing on the left, Asawa documents a bouquet of ranunculus flowers given to her by her son, Adam. This reciprocal artistic gesture captures the exuberant ephemerality of flowers in bloom. Wait too long, and these blossoms are gone. And as charming as the snail in the bottom left corner is, it could also be interpreted as a portentous signal of these artists or these flowers' eventual demise, because snails are a common garden pest. The image on the right is a photograph of what I call an Asawa life vessel, seen here in the Asawa family home, holding flowers from the garden. This object is the ultimate expression of Asawa's philosophy her belief in the essential connection between art and life, and her pragmatism that eschewed any distinction between an object's utility and its capacity to be a work of art. Adam Linear, uh, the giver of this bouquet, predeceased his parents, passing away at the age of 46 in 2003. As one of Asawa's final wishes, she asked her son Paul Lanier to transform what remained of her earthly body so that she may be physically and spiritually reunited with her husband Albert and her son Adam. Paul, an accomplished ceramist who studied under the Bauhaus trained potter Marguerite Wildenhain, mixed their collective ashes with clay made from California soil. Using this special mixture, Paul threw a set of vessels, one for each remaining sibling, and fired them in a Japanese manner in a kiln north of San Francisco. Every image of a flower is a meditation on life and death, 
a picture of a life form in one state before it transitions back into the earth, perhaps to be reborn again. An attentive lifelong gardener, Asawa knew this and considered her own eventual transition, asking to be reincarnated as a different kind of vessel. Made from the landscape that supported her and transformed through her son's creative touch, these resulting objects were expressly made to remain among the living, to be sat with, admired, and used to hold flowers from the family garden. Even in death, Asawa teaches us how to live. Next slide, please. I am reminded of something Asawa's colleague, artist Noah Purifoy, once said, quote, one does not have to be a visual artist to utilize creative potential. Creativity can be an act of living, a way of life, a formula for doing the right thing, end quote. Creativity was Asawa's driving force, her steady drumbeat, and might we say that each of her hundreds of drawings, sculptures, and face masks are not only expressions of moments in her life, but acts of living. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hate the fact that I'm going last in this situation, but I'm also, I also feel that I can be a good segue into the next, uh, into the next subject. Uh, also, thank you, uh, Kim, for, for, for the invitation, Megan, for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here on stage with you guys. Um, this is such a, this is such a, um, this is, I loved hearing both of you. Uh, talk about talk about Rufus Awa in, in such a such a way. I'm actually gonna kind of kind of talk about the same stuff, but I'm gonna talk about it in it from a different perspective, um, which is to say, I think um, I guess fr I guess from which is the reason why I'm here. Like uh, from a, can everybody hear me? By the way, <laughs> All right. from an artist perspective, a little bit, which is to say that uh, so this first slide. Um, is not in the show, is not in the exhibition, but it is in Kim's essay. Uh, it's it that's inside the catalog, which is where I first saw that, and also um, it jumped out to me for a couple reasons. I think there's, so I'm, I'll try to be pretty precise with this. If, I, if I'm talking too long, just let me know. Um, but I am gonna try to be pretty crisp and clear as I can. Uh, so. There's this idea of the breathing line that Kim talks about in her essay. And, that bre and it's for me, that's very interesting. I'm not gonna do the best job of explaining it for the most part, but the way that I understand it is that it's sort of, um, it's sort of kind of like, as opposed to, as opposed to something as simple as like hand-eye coordination and drawing. Uh, it, it feels like it's something that's more about like, hand-lung coordination in drawing. So it's less about sort of what you see uh, in relationship to your hand, it's more about just breathing and moving, like literally your hand kind of at the same time. Um, I don't know if that's accurate, but like when I read it, that's something that I was like, oh, I know that. I can, I can sort of find myself there uh, because there's a kind of, there's a letting go in that moment and there's also a calming effect because it's essentially connecting your body back to your, connecting an aspect of your body uh, in the art of making back to your body, which is, you know, it has this calming effect. And the reason why I say that is because this particular image, uh, Senate finance hearing, 9.30 a.m., uh, P. Coyote seen it. Uh, there's aspects of this that directly correlate to uh, the idea of this, this breathing line, this sort of calming. Okay, so there's two things in this, in, in, in this particular drawing that um, embody two very, very important for me, really, really, uh, I think, uh, important aspects of drawing in general. So the first is what, is what the artist is doing at this very moment, which is to say the artist is in a room at this Senate finance hearing for the uh, California Council, Arts Council, and seemingly in the back of the room or 
on the kind of outs of, of the particular discussion, but you find yourself in this room that's kind of socially intense, socially awkward. And one of the things that I've always done if I'm in a room where I feel uncomfortable is I draw. Uh, the first thing, I mentioned this earlier, it re this, this image brings me back immediately to being a kid in the back of a classroom just doodling in their notebook, maybe because they feel slightly insecure because you know, they, they don't have the answer, they're not part of a particular discussion. But it has this aspect of uh, exclusion, which I think you point, uh, allude to a little bit uh, in your essay, but also this kind of this sitting back and witnessing something. And you know, for me, it reminds me of having a bit of attention, because I think it's a tense moment. It's trying to figure out where the money's going, right? Um, so to a certain extent, it's like, I think there's some, uh, there's some anxiety that one could feel in that room in that moment. So one of the things that I do and one of the things that people tell you to do, actually, when you're in a tense moment is they tell you to breathe. They say, just breathe and try to calm down. I feel like when I see this, what happens is it's more, it's less of a breathing, but it is, it's more just draw, just calm down, just find yourself. I think people use drawing a lot of times as a way to find yourself in a particular moment. So I think when I see this drawing, I see that. I see an artist doing a kind of compulsive behavior in a space so that they can find themselves uh, in this particular situation. And there's something beautiful about that. And it, it, to me, it directly connects to this idea of the breathing line. The second thing that this, that this drawing is doing uh, is a little, it's less about the artist and it's like, I guess it's kind of more for us. It's functioning as a record of a thing that happened in a place that we can all kind of point to. Um, and that sort of, it's ironic, considering it's a Senate finance hearing, it's, it's a, this ends up becoming um, sort of more on the vein of uh, like courtroom sketch artist energy. This is more about, well, this is a thing that's taking place. I need to record this. Um, not so much for my own benefit, but also I need to record this so people know when exactly we were getting screwed over, you know. Uh, but also, so I think there's something about that that fits the more record side of drawing. It fits the more systematic way that drawing could be used, more functional way that drawing could be used, uh, say, in the real world. And uh, I think that also kind of gets into this idea of like, I guess for me it's, and I think we're getting to, it, we'll get to it eventually, uh, but I feel like drawing is one of those, it's actually an art form that is almost clo the closest related to reality. And I say that loosely, but I, I mean that in the sense that I feel like we all have memories of drawing as children, I think we all have memories of trying to draw. And also, uh, it's, it's also an art form that can kind of, uh, that is also, you can kind of see in, uh, we were just talking earlier about schematics, we were talking earlier about uh, architectural drawings, engineering drawings. Uh, these are things that are straight up drawings, but they actually have a function in the world. So I think that aspect alongside the idea of a, a courtroom sketch artist, alongside the idea of say like engineering drawing, or these, these aspects of how, or, or even again, as a child doodling, uh, that's something that's outside of the art world, outside of the art context. That's something that happens in school. That's something that you do uh, that goes back to that compulsive behavior thing. That's not art uh, uh, as, as we talk about it here in this institution. That's that's more of a human behavior thing. Am I doing good on time? Does that make sense? Is that good? Okay. So I have, I have a couple more things, but I'll stop there. Oh, did you want to go? I was wondering if um, maybe what we can do, because I yeah. know your next, the other slide ties into art, so maybe we can have you like start the next section, Sounds if that good. works. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say one thing um, before we move into the first section. We're gonna be pretty fluid, by the way, so we have these things we're gonna talk about, but. We also want to kind of have an open, organic conversation. And 
Um, there's something that you were just describing about this drawing and this kind of mode of the sort of the diaristic um, that I was thinking maybe we like pause for a second on because it seems really meaty and it made me, um, now you're gonna have to correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, Kate, but made me think about a part, a moment in the Lightroom where you're, you're reflecting on, um, I think it's something that Jonas Mekas wrote about diaristic kind of filmmaking versus writing. And there's this part where um, the idea is a written diary is one mode because it's about reflection. It's about something you maybe come to at the end of the day and you're looking back at a situation. Whereas a sort of filmic diary is happy, you have to respond in the moment to the things in front of you. And it made me think of like, this is a much more, we, I mean, we've, I feel like I've heard us talking about Asawa's drawing practice as having this kind of diaristic aspect, but it, there's, a, there's a distinction there <laughs> between the sort of reflection-based diaristic mode and the more immediate, like in the moment, like this is a great example of this, what is in front of you, the kind of witnessing versus reflecting. I'm curious, is this, is this sort of public diary like sketch, sketching like unusual in her sketchbooks or are there, because I always think of like so much of the show or when I think of her, her diaristic like sketching, I think of like the objects of contemplation where it's a slower process. Mm -hmm. And this feels so, so yes, in the moment, kind of fast out in public. Is this a certain period of her life where the sketchbook changed? Um, I would say that, and it's really interesting that um, each of you actually in your images have chosen one of the sketchbooks. So um, Kate, your sketchbook that you chose was from these, this moment in the 50s right. where the children were young and many of those sketchbooks I mean, I think we should just, maybe we just say, um, to, put, to put this on the table, uh, Asawa seemed to always have a sketchbook with her in whatever she was doing, whatever day that may be, which means that the sketchbooks from the 50s are very often um, of or in the home. They're very often filled with sketches of children. There are children's sketches in those sketchbooks also. Um, that is a very common mode. Um, in the 60s, as Asawa was becoming more actively involved in um, the school districts, for example, you have the sketchbooks becoming like meeting notes, but also with drawings in them. In the 70s, where she's very involved with the California Arts Council and other, there are t many, many sketchbooks that are very similar to this, that were really almost a form of, seemingly like a form of note taking mm -hmm. in, in those meetings. Um, so it what, but it was almost like the subjects change because of where she literally is in those times. But some of the drawings, the earlier drawings, have such a sense of privacy to them, and these are so much more when she becomes involved in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so maybe we'll move into our um, one of these first sections we want to talk about. And uh, this relates to kind of these ideas around teaching and learning. And Tony, you were mentioning um, this, you know, your kind of reflections about this kind of almost fluid um, uh, relationship between those two ideas, if you wanted to talk about through the folds. Yeah, it'll be a quick point. It's, it's all, because it's, uh, I feel like what we want to talk about is a little larger and potentially more interesting. But I, when I was looking at this, uh, this work is in the show. Um, and uh, when I was reading about it, and I don't remember Jordan's last name, but in, in the essay that Jordan wrote in the, in the, uh, in the catalog. Jordan Troller. Yes, Jordan Troller. Uh, just really beautiful connection, clear connection uh, between um, Albers and, say, his educational background and history and theory um, and, and almost uh, specifically to uh, uh, origami and and how that and how w Ruth Asawa essentially sort of did this synthesis that I mean to me it sort of it ends up 
a lot of a lot of the uh, the mounted paper folds end up becoming like. I wrote it down, hopefully this makes sense, but it ends up being like this, uh, this, peak, this peak embodiment of, of just, uh, of, um, give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like a, like a peak embodiment of like a learned theory synthesized with like an already existing kind of nature or personality or person um, in this case, and also maybe not so much in this case, this is, you guys can push back on this in any, in any way, in any form, but I see this as sort of like, it's a sort of, uh, it's synthesized with a personal history of potentially a subjugated human being. And the end result ends up being better than the theory. It ends up almost being like the culmination of that theory in a way that makes it, uh, it's sort of kind of, um, I feel like it's, a, it's like one of the sharpest achievements of like making a particular artwork in that it accomplishes the thing, the language, a particular tradition or theory uh, and brings it to its kind of peak. And it sort of manifests in a way that kind of, um, in a way that, you know, I myself am an artist working, striving to get to that kind of frequency um, today. And I know a lot of artists who, who are uh, trying to get to that sort of frequency. And I think that's a complicated thing. I don't know if I'm exactly right, but it also feels like something that when I see this, it's like, oh, I can clearly see how this is influenced by a thing, but I can also see how it basically takes that thing and makes it entirely like its own other thing and uh, like you see it and it's happening and it's happening at the same time it's like you hear two notes hitting at the same time which make an entirely different sound and I feel like that to me uh, it's you know getting to teaching get sorry I'm like I know you have something to say but like getting to teaching and, and understanding how one can take can learn and sort of take a thing but then also that gets in get that gets into a whole nother uh, uh, history, I think, of, of uh, well, I don't want to get to that yet, of, of Rufus I was teaching, which is, to me, extraordinary because of, like, that moment, but also where she takes it after this. Like, after that kind of synthesis, her energy goes somewhere else, which she then sort of disseminates through teaching, you know, which is quite brilliant. I just wanted to uh, pick up on what you said before I forgot it. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, <laughs> you know. Um, because I love this idea of synthesis, like what you're talking about, this synthesis of sources that clearly, that this is built off of something that she learned at Black Mountain, right? This paper folding that is at once about Albert's pedagogical philosophy of like really just looking at the elements that you have at hand but then also related to the scarcity of materials that were available at Black Mountain. So you had to be able to use you know, everything. You, ha you had to be able to fold a piece of paper multiple times, right? Um, and I, it's a, such an expression of her as a learner. So she was such a great teacher, I think in part because she was such a great learner in this way that she synthesized different sources. And that um, piece that we were just looking at functions so nicely as an abstract aesthetic object, but then you know when you dig deeper, you learn that oh, she did paper folding, of course, in the schools, and she made these amazing, almost kind of like costume works that she engaged with students as dancers, right? So they become partially choreography. Um, these are things that you can mount on the wall. They become costume and choreography, and then she's looking to this form when she's making um, her Japantown. Uh, public sculpture commission in San Francisco. So that work is cast in bronze, but drawn from this folded paper. So it's like, this is a great object because like so many other works in her practice, it just like expands out into, you know, so many other parts of her life and things that she was doing. It's like related to Black Mountain, but then related to her work as a teacher, but then related to her public sculpture and like everything is a synthesis with Asawa, right? 
think the first encounter I had with Mikasawa's work was actually the laundry print that the MoMA had on exhibit, which you know she innovated while working. I mean, she she I mean everyone had to work at Black Mountain College. That was part of of being an art student there. Was you were supposed to you know work in various ways, um, but she she worked so much and was essentially a scholarship student there. But these like beautiful um, laundry prints from working in the laundry at Black Mountain, and that you see that practicality and the sort of merging of labor with aesthetics with the later potato prints once she's a teacher. So like carrying that over from what she learned there, but then also just the, the scarcity and the practicality of, of, of seeing and, and making as a child. Like it's, it's so consistent yeah. across her life. And what she teaches students, she uses in her own practice. It's not just an exercise or like a demonstration, you know? It's like she takes it as seriously as she expects the students to take it as well as an exercise. Because it's not just an exercise, right? It's you are making something here. So I, I just love that it's not separate. It's not like, oh, I'll teach you how to fold paper, but then I'm going to go home and make art that's actually different. Right. It's like, no, I'm doing the same thing here. Um, something else I think um, that is a, like a nice piece of background information and thinking about when Asawa begins, as you sort of see in the image on the right, to do this kind of working with paper folding in the schools, um, some of this comes out of her frustration with the types of kind of art assignments that she saw her own children coming home with. And it, this also makes me think of this idea of like the sort of the, both the scarcity of, of materials, but also this, the, the practicality of working with the material that's sort of always there, like a sheet of paper. So you imagine if you're seeing your kids coming home with, um, I think the, the things that particularly bothered her were like coloring sheets, you know, like coloring in like a printed something, it's on a sheet of paper. So is there another way <laughs> that we could use this sheet of paper? And in fact, by teaching paper folding, you're teaching students how to see and you're teaching them how to um, er, sort of also understand all the potential in the simplest objects around you, which I think is very beautiful. And I like thinking of her deep friendship and collaboration with Buckminster Fuller, who she met while at Black Mountain College. And this is something I write about a little bit in the Lightroom, how Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller's mother was a kindergarten teacher. You know, and that so much of the early you know, sculptures and experiments for him were based on Froebel's gifts. Right, so we're based on these the aesthetics of of you know early education pedagogy, and so I, I see Ruth Asawa as an artist who is also really inspired by the toys and the activities of children. That it's it's so organic for her education and art together. Maybe a good segue to um, this slide, which. Um, you know, really brings together this, I think, exercise that we often think of as, as a, a children's exercise, the idea of like nature printing, printing leaves, printing potatoes, printing vegetables. Um, but something that she, you know, Kate mentioned, the work she did when she was at Black Mountain College working in a laundry room and kind of using these kind of found materials of the stamp, of the, of the laundry stamp to make drawings and then kind of continuing that practice throughout her life with um, something I think we've thought about a lot in these leaf prints, for example, where the final work, it's, it's almost as if she's, you know, it's this like deep appreciation for um, forms in nature and the idea that in printing such a form as a leaf, this living thing, that you're almost like drawing out the drawing within it. <laughs> We've had many people in the, in the yeah. um, exhibition who have seen these leaf prints and have asked if they're graphite drawings. There is, a, there is this quality of line that is inherent in the object itself. And then we love this idea of this, again, this kind of continual teaching and learning between making these objects herself, but also these are um, you know, two of her um, grandchildren. Um, 
just you know printing leaves with her because that's what one would do with <laughs> when your grandmother was Rukasawa. <laughs> it brings it makes me think of uh, a point uh, in Elise's essay. Sorry, I'm making reference to the essay, but there's some great writing in it. And so it's sort of it's such a uh, it's 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 like it's got my my brain all over the place. But there's a there's a, a moment in your essay, Elise. You talk about, there's a quote roughly around. Um, uh, Ruth Osawa saying something about you know uh, finding your own cycle or, or your own cycle uh, and finding it through this, the cycles of nature, yeah. through the cycles of animals and plants. And that when you were talking, Kim, that reminded me of yeah that focus of like you know it's a real thing. It's like it's a real. Uh, uh, um, it's almost like it, it's it's an absolute focus theme like. It's a research project to a certain extent. But it made me think about, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, you pay attention to the life cycle of those plants and animals, so to speak, so that you can find your own life cycle, so you can find your own place in the world. And it got me thinking about, uh, you know, it got me thinking about, wow, teaching is really an extension of community building a lot of times. And I, I think the relationship between it's basically when you're teaching, you're in a room with some people, you know, you can, you know, or, or you're talking to someone. So I think it's almost the beginning of, of creating a sense of community, which is exactly what like Black Mountain College was. It's like it's this 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 sort of uh, blurring of the lines almost between community and teaching, which I find to be such an interesting idea. And then it got me thinking about, you know, it seems as though teaching became a way um, to gain a sense of community, so that you could see a lot of different cycles from other people and maybe you can find your way uh find your own sort of cycle uh by 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 being by being surrounded by so many different cycles and so many different sort of ways of going about it and it gets it gets me to um and i i personally connected to that th those general principles I, I i because i saw it Recently, I think in, in my experience in Chicago, one of uh, one of my best friends, uh, his name was Gregory Bay, and uh, he was an artist. Uh, and he, um, we went to graduate school together, and uh, he was probably one of the. Um, he would be. He's very well. Uh, established in the Chicago art community. And I think in a way that Greg was the type of person that would find his way into all the different pockets of Chicago's art community and be friends with everybody. And that he was in a unique position to sort of um, essentially bring people together that wouldn't have otherwise been brought together. And I, you know, he was, more recently he was a, uh, he was uh, the, I believe he was a co-founder of of a uh, of an arts collective, which he named uh, Goddamn, uh, which was in which which was in influenced and follow, followed the kind of the, the history of the uh, Asian art collective Godzilla, and Godzuki. Um, he followed his up with Goddamn, <laughs> but it was founded in Chicago, and it was uh, something that didn't exist. Uh, in Chicago until Greg sort of put that together and he did it out of necessity. And it makes me think it's sort of like what he was able to accomplish with that was pretty amazing uh, in, and of, in, and of, in and of his own right. But I can't help but think about um, he did as he, I feel like he was doing that in essential as a way to kind of find his own cycle through a series of cycles. And you end your essay with this line um, I feel like Greg, Greg did that, I feel like Ruth did that as a way to understand the limits and possibilities of one's time on Earth. And that really hit me because like, it's so strongly connected to, you know, not, it's, it's not just like making art in a, in a box in solitude, it's like, no, there is a grander kind of sense of, uh, I think, self and community and energy that you get from the people that you that you want to surround yourself by, and it just so it just 
I couldn't help but think about that when I was reading your essay. And, all, and also it's like completely, you know, uh, anyways. Well, so much of the cult of the artist is solitary, like in one studio practice, you know, this, and this is all like the markers of capitalism, right? Like, you know, all about oneself, all about overthrowing one's mentors. And when I think of Ruth Asawa, I'm really struck by how she was always a student her entire life and how she paid tribute to her mentors, how she thought about community. Um, you know, even just thinking about her calligraphy classes when she was a child or the Walt Disney animators who were in the camp with her, who taught her how to draw or the, the devotion she had for her early um, art teachers. Um, this idea of always learning, not needing to be like a god, not needing to be um, like this genius. There is such a genius to this like generative nature of her that, that she was always thinking of learning and of teaching. Yeah, and that's also one of my favorite things about Asawa too is that she really um, provides this different model of what an artist can look like and what a creative life can look like. And one of my, I'll paraphrase from one of my favorite things that she said where she talked about making art in the snatches of time or something like that that were given to her, which of course you have to do if you have six children. And apparently she was also really kind of an insomniac, which like sometimes I wish I was. I was like, man, I would get, <laughs> I would get a lot more done if I didn't have to like, like I don't have six kids and I don't do this much, you know, I need to sleep less. But um, you know, this idea that it's all, it's all incremental or it's kind of an accretion or it's like, a, you know, it's an accumulation. Like you make a looped sculpture like that in 10 minute segments, right? It's not, like they look monumental, but it's really just stealing away these bits of time to like kind of slowly work towards something. And I've actually like, I think about her saying that a lot when it comes to trying to accomplish things in my own life that, you know, we think about an artist having to be alone in a studio, having to have uninterrupted long breaks of time when that is simply just like not something that can be really accessible for a lot of people. And like we were talking about earlier, Kate, and it wasn't accessible for her either because she lived this kind of precarious existence. I mean, it was this time in San Francisco when you could kind of get away with that sort of thing where, you know, she worked with the commercial gallery briefly, but then stopped. And then, you know, she was doing, she was raising kids and um, doing these workshops and, you know, founding things like Scrap, like the Scrounger Center for Reusable Art Parts, like doing all these kind of side projects, just trying to make stuff happen um, in a really respectable way. Uh, and she, you know, she really did it. I, I think, you know, what I've heard is like, through when she was alive, a lot of people really kind of just thought of her as this community figure, and it was sort of less about her artwork. And now, posthumously, we associate her with the artwork and it's sort of less about her community work and like I hope we get to the point where we can kind of just bring it all together right where we talk about all of these things um, in connection to each other because that's one of my main takeaways in looking at Asawa's life is this different kind of model um, than what we are taught of what a what creative practice is right and what that kind of life can look like or be like There was that photograph that I skipped over that was in my presentation because I thought we would get to it. Yeah, okay, it's, it's so beautiful. I mean, you probably you saw it in the show. Is it in the show? It's not in the show, okay. Uh, Imogen Cunningham, the photographer who she had this amazing friendship with, this intergenerational friendship. But this is of, you know, the baby is naked on the floor yeah. with a bottle. You know, Ruth Asawa is, you know, just making the sculpture. The children, you know, one of the, Children are playing, they're watching, they're engaging. When I was, I was going to be induced in August of the pandemic, you know, people weren't allowed inside the hospital. You know, my three-year-old was staying with someone and I, and I woke up at like five in the morning and I looked at this photo. And uh, I don't know, there was, and I think there can be a danger to say that she was some sort of super mom. It, 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 it misses like the exhaustion or the fact that capitalism does not allow easily one to just exist with children, one to be able to, to have this together. She sacrificed so much to have her vision of home and art 
feel organic, but there was something about this image before I really knew a lot about Ruth Osawa that galvanized me because I think it did offer this other model that could be thinking with and working with as opposed to one of, of isolation. And it's just so great that it was taken by another incredible woman artist that like... Who's watching her. Who's watching her, yeah. right? So I was like, she was 40 something years her senior and they met when like I saw it was 24. It's just like the coolest thing. There's, um, I wrote this down now, I'm glad that I did because I wouldn't have remembered it. Um, but the, um, the quote that we have included in the, in the wall text um, upstairs, which is really um, something that Imogen Cunningham said to Ruth Asawa, they, as you said, this kind of inter really beautiful like intergenerational friendship, um, and that Imogen said to Asawa, an artist can still create by observing what is around them, children, plants, and making images that can be savored when we are old, which is, I think, something that, yeah, feels very much in keeping with like them both kind of having that, that spirit. Um, staying with this idea of maybe um, exchange between people, um, these kind of conversations that often exist through artworks, uh, we wanted to also talk, uh, you know, a bit about this idea of reciprocity that we've, um, you know, I think something we thought about a lot in thinking about some of these objects in the exhibition. So we're looking here at two of these other kind of object prints, like the last leaf print that we were seeing. And here we really wanted to think about the fact that um, it was a very common practice for many people in Asawa's life, her children, her friends. Um, everybody knew she loved to draw and they knew she had such wonderful curiosity about you know, nature and things around her. They would often bring her gifts, whether that was flowers or elements from the garden, um, in this case, a leaf from the Sacramento Delta that her daughter Aiko brought her, um, or the fish that her son Adam caught. Um, and this idea that so often, in this case, you know, Asawa is actually doing sort of a direct, almost indexical um, impression of the objects themselves. Other times, if it's bouquets, she's, she's drawing them, these kind of botanical garden, uh, botanical drawings that Elisa was talking about before. Um, and we've talked about these almost as like the a an act of care or an act of thanks, an act of gratitude, um, almost reflecting back to the gift giver um, through the work itself. And I was wondering if that was something else we could you know, talk about here. Yeah, so, I mean, so I think what's, what's m the most interesting thing, the thing that's most exciting to me is uh, not the most exciting, but I, I think based off of what you were just talking about is, I guess how um, uh, uh, lowercase everything is, which is to say that it's not like an official thing. It's like, this is just a life move. It's just like, this is a thing I was doing. It's like, we're talking about things that aren't normally talked about in an art context. We're talking about, we're talking about like exchanging between families and friends. You know, it's like my, my studio is in a separate place from where I live. It's not all, it's, it's not how it is, you know, for most artists, but that's how it is for a lot. But there's, you know, for particular reasons, I need a bit of a separation because I'm a little messy in my studio. But um, the way that we talk about these, we are talking about, uh, you know, words like reciprocity and generosity and giving and care. These are wonderful, wonderful things, but it's interesting because I feel like we don't, in an art context, we talk, we tend to talk about those things with like a capital letter. We talk about them like in quotations. We talk about it like in relationship to the art, uh, which is to say it's like a subject of the art. But here it's like, no, it's not the subject of the art. It, it's just the thing itself. It's just the move. It's just like, it's just like love. And it's just like, there's, a, there's, there's, the stuff that we we look at, the stuff that that we that's you know around is like evidence of that sort of love, and it's like man, this is just like it's like going to work or like <laughs> you know take like the way you're talking about taking care of your children is like such an incredible thing. It's like it's from my perspective, art is one of those things that sort of sits below that um, in a way that I don't know if that's necessarily 
true. I don't know if that's necessarily the opinion everybody might have, but it feels like it's so much more important because it's so much more integral to like life. And so I, I just find that, at least to me, the way that we're talking about these things, I think what's so great is that it is all uh, lowercase. It is all like, no, this is the thing. It's like not so much, it's not a performance of it. It's just the thing yeah, over here. That, lowercase, life in lowercase. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. really, like if you look at the Small titles, forms, everything's yeah. like untitled. Yeah, well, the, well the, her work <laughs> is so, the sculptures are so ornate and like the, the, the flower drawings are so ornate and I think there's no hierarchy between the small and then the incredibly ornate, that they're all part of this process. But I do think we can think about her gifts, like the drawing or the print becomes a gift back in a way. When we think in, a, in an art context, I mean, she was friends with Ray Johnson her entire life. They knew each other when they were teenagers in Wisconsin. Like she, she was from Wisconsin. Like they knew each other when they were young. And when we think of his work, it's so much within male art, right? I'm gonna make this image, I'm gonna send it to a friend. And so it, I think it's it's beautiful to think of her with her children and most, I mean, most of these in the show, I at least I observed, were gifts from her children, right? So they had that devotional quality, but she was such an, an, an artist. We're even thinking of Maura Davey, who's in a show right now at the Whitney, right? The idea of work that is about friendship and kind of passing back and like mailing to each other or sending to each other. Yeah, I think, you know, beyond the object, what I really love about these are the way that it is teaching her children or her students, for example, how to see the world creatively, right? When you are finding a leaf like that and you're coming across that in nature and you are recognizing the aesthetic capacity of that leaf, and then you have the forethought to take that leaf home from the Sacramento Delta to give to your mom because you know your mom would like it because your mom is an artist, right? Like, was it like a contest for them? Like, who could give something to their mother that, <laughs> who, she, that she would, would like the most? Like, the, you yeah. could, the fish you is so like beautiful. A lineup of all the Mother's Day yeah. bouquets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who wore it best? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it must have. Been. I haven't asked them that, but that's a good question. Um, but yeah, I just love that's just it's such a teaching someone a way to see the world around them beyond the object, right? It's about a kind of a recognition of aesthetic capacity. There's also something so much about um, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but maybe just to like put a f like a emphasis on it, just nature and the idea of like the thing that connects everyone, all beings and the, the recognition of the beauty in that, um, that is not just the thing that is all around us, but that the thing that is, that does like connect all, all humans. My impression was, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I saw with the drawings of Addie that they were not for sale, that she did not want them to be sold. Is that like consistent with the drawings that she usually, they weren't seen as commodities for her? It wasn't like I finished this and I'm going to to sell it, it had a more private aspect. Yeah, to it. definitely, right, Kim, like these are mostly objects that were kept in the family. I mean, and actually like when she, she wanted to show a lot of her works on paper throughout her life and she kept asking for shows of it and like no one would give it to her, they just wanted her sculptures. So um, finally it's happened, <laughs> you know? But yeah, these are definitely not, I don't think for the most part commodities for her. Yeah, I mean, also as Elisa knows, um, this the leaf print on the left here, which is you know one of the largest works in the show. In fact, um, this this actually exists in the Stanford archives. So this is something that is with her papers at Stanford, yeah. um, not even in a you know not in a um, museum context or in a collection context, but but actually with um, that that kind of material. Yeah, exactly. Like you you know. I'm so happy, obviously, Stanford is well represented here, but it's all from special <laughs> collections. It's from the libraries. It's not from the canter, right? So these are things that were kept in a kind of family archive um, rather than separated out. I mean, even her family told me that her life masks for a long time were um, thought of as kind of ephemera, that they were not necessarily something that um, they considered as part of her larger practice. So, um, you know, it's just, there, there's been a tremendous expansion of our understanding of her practice over the last decade or so. Um, and I think that um, even just the institutional placement of an object like this reflects that. 
Um, I might, uh, this is yet another slide actually that is maybe kind of touching on this idea of reciprocity, it's kind of gift giving and maybe more specific to, um, uh, to, these, to these drawings or watercolors um, often coming from the garden, a garden, a neighbor's garden, um, both, you know, this, this leaf that's, you know, I think the most extraordinary leaf that I've personally it's like the best <laughs> ever <leaf> seen drawing <laughs> the ever. best leaf drawing so ever. <laughs> those roots are like oh my god <laughs> um and then and then the irises as well which is um which is a work that um Asawa uh, worked on during a period of also you know sort of convalescence of healing um after a, a very debilitating bout with lupus in the mid 80s um, where watercolor was a medium that um, really allowed her to kind of keep working um, and to do so in a way that was also kind of replenishing for her. And I was thinking in these as well about um, you know, these both being, again, as I said, gifts from others, um, but also thinking about like the replenishing quality of nature um, that Asawa was also a gardener. Um, I'm not gonna put Elisa on the spot, but I know Elisa also does <laughs> a lot of gardening. Um, and I was just thinking about that as this, you know, not just kind of nature in the world around her, but also what she grew, this kind yeah. of the cultivation of, um, of, of this world in, in her backyard. Yeah, if I can just add briefly, like one um, interesting point uh, that is related to nature and gardening is that you know, the Alvarado Arts Workshop was, um, and uh, you know, a lot of her elementary school programs were supported by CETA, by these kind of federally funded arts programs. And that they, CETA also supported the first community gardens in San Francisco in the 1970s. And so if you live in the Bay Area, we're full of community gardens. Um, and that is something that is really kind of part of the culture. And so, and that kind of also emerged in the 70s as well, which I find uh, so fascinating. Um, so I just wanted to like add that little point of context in there. Um, I'm also, I don't want to put Kate on the spot, but I was thinking about um, your writing and even thinking about like the language of flowers and this idea of, of the park and the kind of the replenishing qualities of that that you've thought about or written about. Right, and also, I mean, along with the community garden in the 70s, like this idea, and, and, and so many public parks, um, their, their renovation, this idea of the commons, which I think links to the community, the importance of it. But looking at the leak, I keep thinking of what I read in Marilyn Chase's biography, that she grew up on this truck farm. I mean, she grew up planting green yeah. onions. This is, this is, this is a, a durational act, this drawing. It's an act of such care and attention but she has been observing onions since she, her entire life, right? This is, this is um, the knowledge she must have of this and also just the symmetry of the fields, the symmetry of an, an onion being planted. This is, this is an entire lifetime at this point of, of thinking about gardening and farming. Yeah, and thank you, um, Tony, for um, highlighting the quote of hers at the end of the essay where she talks about, you know, teaching gardening to children because that was also part of her program was not just teaching them art, it was teaching them how to garden. And she was saying, you can't force a flower to bloom, right? You have to wait for plants to grow and you have to teach children about these cycles. You have to teach people that everything has to happen in its own time. Um, and it's so true and it's so powerful and rewarding. I used to, yes, Kim, I used to garden a lot, uh, especially during the pandemic. I had my own community garden plot with my partner, but then the pandemic, um, you know, sort of subsided a little bit and the art world took over my life again and now I don't have it anymore. But, um, <laughs> so it's very unfortunate, but um, it's true. It requires such sort of attention and there's also so much that's like kind of out of your hands, right? You can plant something, you can try, but then like nature has its own way and you, you, your plants don't grow. Um, so it's such, it's all, you know, connected again to this kind of philosophy of like teaching children how to see the world, teaching them about cycles and about how important that is. This durational thing that you're talking about, Kate, that it's like, there's really a durational aspect of her practice that's very visible in her drawings as well as her loop sculpture, her loop wire sculpture is like, that is 
that's like really another media and another element that she's playing with is time, I think. Maybe a good segue to um, another couple of images um, where we're kind of thinking about this idea of, um, yeah, it's maybe this sense of like working in like deep time or this idea of um, these more interior drawing practices that she had, which were very much about kind of the evolution of line. This obviously, as you can see immediately, it's not, this is not her looking at a flower and observing something in front of her, but rather following the logic of the Greek meander, um, both mathematical, but also intuitive. Um, this is one of her exercises from Black Mountain College, where I think the students were really um, uh, encouraged to practice this particular form because it held in its in its you know in its rule, which is that it's basically a line that moves forward, coils back onto itself, and then can uncoil again and continue ad infinitum. It holds the quality of the infinite. Um, it also holds this uh, potentially kind of perfect balance of positive and negative space. Um, it, it, it encapsulates all of it in a way. Um, and that this was like a, a, another type of, you know, these are other exercises, kind of line exercises that Asawa would do um, later in her life um, when she's in San Francisco in the 50s and the 60s of these kind of exercises in following line logic. And these I always think of when you're, you're describing like temporality. Yeah. This is a different type of absorption. Yeah, that one of the redwood is so great because it's just, you know, like both of these are such great examples of these are clearly abstract forms, but then again, grounded in nature, right? Grounded in life from this unique perspective of um, looking at a redwood tree's rings, right? That, that itself is an observation of time, right? And duration, and then also a, a connection to um, the wonderful Bay Area landscape around her. Didn't her Black Mountain teachers always say she was too messy? Like, wasn't that always the criticism of her drawing? Yes, yeah, that, isn't that, that right? Yeah, that, that. <laughs> yeah, and we, we also found, um, I think I have one of these um, lettering exercises illustrated in my essay from, um, from earlier, from, from middle school, where she's working these lettering exercises, and they're like, work more slowly for neatness. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, because her family also, I think her, you know, her children will talk about how um, uh, you know, in, in some ways, the the quality of line in some of these drawings has such a a tidiness in its organic nature, and yet they will say like, "Oh yeah, this was that was not she was that was not her um, her practice. She was much more kind of it was a very messy practice, not something that is reflected as much in what we she observe today." This is another. Um, a uh, couple examples of both one of these, I think also kind of line exercises, these types of works this, in this tied wire sculpture drawing that you're seeing on the left, these exercises that she would often do um, at night, it seems, you know, like when this, this the, in, the photograph on the right of her drawing, that's her kitchen table. Um, so you can imagine that the time in the day that the kitchen table is in fact open for the taking is at night when everyone's asleep. Um, those tonnet chairs at the table appear in other um, chair drawings of hers, in fact, in the exhibition, in her work. Um, but it, you can also see this, one thing that I think we noticed in seeing many photographs of Asawa working, in so many drawings, if she's working on you know, a, a flowers or on a bouquet or on, she's looking out and she's not looking at the paper. She's looking at her subject and just going. And in these, she's always kind of, you know, it's, a d it's even a different posture. It feels like a completely different mode of making. I'm kind of obsessed with photographs of women artists working at their dining room table. The only, I, I was, I, it also reminds me of Etel Adnan, who also made work in California, and also about nature, about mountains. And the, I don't know, something about that it doesn't have to be a studio. It doesn't have to be this austere practice. There's something so warm and yet chaotic about doing it at your dining room table. I, I mean, like 
you're absolutely right. I feel like I've, you know, I have lots of different types of drawings. Some need to happen in like a studio. Some need to happen uh, in like a gallery space. But the ones I think that end up, at least for me, having ironically the most meaning, uh, the ones that I feel kind of most connected to, even the ones with the, the, the subject matter is even closer related to a personal childhood memory is the are the drawings that are about two inches tall and I made hundreds of them in an armchair while I was watching a really bad movie. <laughs> and like that energy is is something that you can't really uh, you can't find it anywhere else but home. You can't find that kind of comfort, freedom and focus. It's a different type of focus I think when you're working in that space, which uh, is, it's, um, again, it, it's, a, it's a little more, it, it, it's, it's just a little bit more meaningful, because it's less, it's less, uh, going back to the idea of being, less, uh, it's less performative. It's, it's a little more honest. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead a tiny bit, but I can't resist going, you know, taking us from the kitchen table to the chairs <laughs> from the table, um, the seven of them, in fact, in this drawing. I also love this idea that there's seven chairs, and I guess at this point, <coughs> it's in the 50s, she may have had all six children by then, she may have just had five, but um, either way, seven chairs was always gonna be like not quite enough. <laughs> um, so maybe she's in one of the chairs and reflecting on it, um, but almost the idea of reflecting or kind of, this, is, this was, um, a slide that we had thought about in relation to this question of dailiness, of kind of care and of kind of taking in what's in the what's there in the world immediately around you. Um, the idea of also this the sense of light, of like weightlessness in the chairs that are rendered in there um, almost as negative space, but through the marks around them. the most amazing like abstraction of a kitchen and you almost can imagine is there a is there a form of a table in that kind of negative space that's there and we're sort of imagining the chairs around it or are they kind of dancing around the space but the chairs that she would be sitting in to eat you know she was also she loved cooking preparing food for others but also the the chairs that she was sitting in for making yeah i really again sort of what you're saying too kate is that you know the domestic space as being this very inspirational space this like like the home as a like kind of thrumming hub of like a creative force right like that everything that's within the space of the home is something that uh, one can consider within their creative practice and that it doesn't need to be separate and for her home by the way for those of us who have been there for me it is like the closest thing I've ever come to going to church where I felt like oh my god this is exactly like, this is again, a model of what I want life to look like. It's this incredible home that was partially built by her husband, Albert, who um, is an architect and it was filled with her work. And they lived among the work, they ate among the work. Um, you know, she created it there, seating, like seated around her work. Uh, it's just, once again, this wonderful model of existing with creativity and then looking at the things that surround you in an almost kind of a compulsive way, like you were talking about this, Tony, like it's, there's like a bit of compulsion in her like creative practice that um, she was always doing, her hand was always flowing, as you said, Kim, she was always in the process of making something. And, and we have to remember that she was not making the majority of this for sale, like we talked about. Like this didn't have a, that kind of aspect or function to it she was making to make things, right? Because she saw the value in that. She had that kind of discipline and work mm -hmm. ethic to always keep going, right? To always be looking, to always be in this kind of generative mode. And I think in all the, all the works that, 100% I agree, and what you were saying, again, about the whole, about um, that compulsive behavior, I feel like a lot of what we're, we've been looking at recently in the images are, uh, a, a, like a, an absolute uh, master display of of doodling, <laughs> you know, in terms of like 
it, which is it's essentially is like a really compulsive. You know, there's a there's a teacher, there was a there's an artist um, who I knew as a teacher uh, named Barbara Rossi, who was a Chicago imagist. I'm sorry, I keep talking about Chicago, um, but um, but I I, w I remember being her teaching assistant, and I and and I remember uh, she had a class on uh, uh, experimental drawing, and it was. Uh, one of the most incredible, uh, you know, uh, one of the most incredible syllabus syllabi I've ever seen in terms of how she introduced just the idea of drawing and doodling. It had everything to do with cultivating this level of uh, compulsive behavior and mark making, everything to do with, um, th if you look at this image, I think one of the reasons why I say master is because it, doodling a lot of times starts from kind of nothing it starts from like play. It starts in one way and then it morphs into something else and changes. This is starting with the most absolutely exquisite uh, silhouette <laughs> of, of a kitchen chair, which is the mastery of it. But then to then you see the growth of, these, of this pattern and the growth sort of like echoing the object. But that growth is to me, you can kind of see it in the, uh, the two chairs in the middle. If you look at the one on the left, in relationship to the one that's on the edge, the growth of both of those chairs kind of milling it, and like smushing in together, creating this really weird, like that to me uh, is this kind of, this, this doodling energy, this constant it's really accumulation. It's really big too. This is a huge, I mean she must and have been on the floor. It's I mean, very physical. It's what is this? It's 42 by 60. It's like a table. Yeah. But it ends up becoming this really beautiful, um, uh, just kind of, you know, going again, going back to this idea of compulsive hand moving, the, the, the keeping going, the constantly working thing. You kind of see it in the sort of intricate kind of, but again, it's, it really is like a, a uh, just a, a, a really elevated, very eloquent version of doodling. When I say that say, as somebody who, who doodles, I say that as saying doodling is absolutely part of the studio. So it's not doodling in a bad sense, it's doodling in like, I'm so grateful that I can still doodle because it's such an elemental, sun, such a fundamental way of thinking about drawing for me. And I, I do believe that it's a, a fundamental way to thinking about drawing. Yeah, uh, and well, you know, drawing and, and doodling, are, these are, for most of us, like our entry point into making art is we start with drawing. And, and it's so funny to start with that because I feel like it's like one of the harder <laughs> things to, um, to do, but and of course, there's this is probably the case for all media, but it's one of those things that really rewards repetition. Like you really see your own improvement when you keep doing it because it requires so much sort of experience and confidence of the hand to be able to make forms with that kind of negative space. Like those are that those chairs are just made with like the accumulation of single marks, and yet like when you look at all of those single marks together, they outline like these incredible, perfect chairs. And that is such, the, this is like, her hand is so confident and you can really see that in a lot of her work. And that's what's so kind of remarkable about it because it, it like drawing like this, there's nowhere to really hide, especially also with like her contour drawing too, where she is not really lifting her hand and she's just going, you know, on the page um, and looking at the object and then putting it down on the page. It's such an incredibly like, strong and interesting way of making um, an image. How did she have the time to make this? Like on the floor with six children around her because she did not have childcare. And the biography tells us the husband never changed a diaper. That she did this with a felt tipped pen and a child didn't like take yeah. the marker <laughs> and draw all over this. She must have had a lot of like discipline with, you know, like they knew not to go near it. It's funny because like the kids are there in There's the chairs, but they couldn't have been in the room while this is happening. Right. Doesn't this feel like it's a night drawing? Yeah. I yeah. always thought this was a <laughs> night drawing, even when you describe this, the, this, when you think about the size of this sheet and how it would fit very nicely at that large kitchen table and oh, hey, look at the subjects that happen to be right around this kitchen table, the chairs. <laughs> so I always saw this as a, as a, night, a nocturnal project. Um, but who knows? Okay, so um, I think that we are 
Do we have time for questions? No, okay, we are out of time. <laughs> sorry, we got very absorbed in our conversation. This was amazing. Um, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop in just to say it's eight o'clock, so thank oh my you God, all I'm sorry. for your incredible <laughs> attention, these awesome, I mean, this was just such a rich conversation. Thank you so much. Before you start clapping, which you should do, I want to just say, in addition to the exhibition catalog and the Lightroom, we have some hard to find copies of Tony's monograph. I didn't know that we had gotten them in. Um, Tony, I heard it was like sold out or you know, like the distributors don't have it. So we have a few. If you will sign them, there's, there's also pens out there for your, um, the doodling. And, um, and the exhibition is on view until nine, so you can go up to the eighth floor after you after you buy your Christmas gifts, your holiday <laughs> gifts. Um, I'm really sorry. I'm <laughs> thank you.